try to get out of these lights. Hi, thank you. <laughs> and see, I've been making notes on this ever since I was here from early yesterday morning, and so it's kind of a mess, so we'll see how. I'm sorry I have to read it, but I'm a writer. <laughs> so I apologize to those of you whose images flash by. Let's see where I, I should go. get going. Images flash by anonymously to do them justice. I just don't have time, so think of it like being spontaneously exposed to public art. <laughs> it was great to see all the very specific ideas presented yesterday, and I'm going to be more sort of general and retro. Uh, but there is a lot of reinventing the wheel going on, and I thought maybe we'd go back a little bit. I'm. Uh, hardly an expert on urban space, having lived rurally for 20 years now. So I'm going to use the collage aesthetic that's always been my baseline and juxtapose Lower Manhattan, where I lived from 1958 to 1993, and Galisteo, the tiny New Mexico village where I've lived full time for the last 20 years. And I mean tiny, this is population 250. <laughs> that's Galisteo. The subtitle of Lure of the Local a book I published years ago was Senses of Place in a Multi-Centered Society. And much has been written about the sense of place, which is symbiotically related to a sense of displacement. I'm ambivalent about this phrase even as I'm touched by it. It's become not only a cliche, but a kind of intellectual property, a way for non-belongers to belong without doing anything other than declare their undying love for wherever they find themselves. A true sense of place is a virtual immersion rooted in lived experience, political commitment, and a topographical familiarity that's really kind of rare today. The plural, senses of place, on the other hand, makes it clear that all the senses are involved. Every place is different for every inhabitant, and most of us are formed by our experiences of multiple places and spaces. Boundaries are rapidly blurring, that was really what the last slide was about, between urban, exurban, suburban, rural, agricultural, open space, and so-called wilderness. So it gets more difficult to pinpoint one's location or dislocation. A rural public artist from Ireland reminds me that the city is sustained by the invisible other, dismissed by urbanites at their own risk. Just as city kids often don't know that their milk comes from cows, Urbanites don't seem to understand that their lives depend on increasingly devastated countryside, where fracking, agribusiness, clear-cutting, water contamination, air pollution, just to name a few, are the prices paid by non-city dwellers. <laughs> Got a fracking activist out there. Um, nature, whatever that is, was rarely mentioned yesterday, but we had it uh, this morning, thank goodness. The material antithesis of the modern city is its rural birthplace, the pit, a metaphor for the bottom level of the 21st century cultural landscape, extraction in aid of erection. According to the Center for Land Use Interpretation, the aggregate industry is the largest in the US. Gravel pits transform geological pasts into dubious concrete futures. If the, future, if the city is vertical, as a climb leading to a, few, to a privileged overview, Landscape is predominantly horizontal, a walk through all walks of life, face to face, what uh, Kenny Bailey was talking about yesterday. Rural places give and urban places take away, resources and population. Nomadism and cosmopolitanism are necessarily woven into celebrations of place, including my own. But Bernd Hupov has observed that critical theory has demonstrated a lack of sensitivity to the local the regional, the vernacular. Could the regions be the crack in the tight architecture of economic and cultural globalization, he asks? Could they open spaces of creativity in indigenous languages? That's where I'm coming from. The rant in The Lure of the Local was that we should take responsibility for our places, urban, rural, whatever in between, no matter how long or short a time we've lived there, if we've truly lived there. The indigenous Tano people who inhabited the Galisteo Basin from the 1200s to 1700s saw movement as a way of life. As they moved, each new home became the center of the world. What I call multi-centeredness implies a serial sensitivity to place, which can be an invaluable social and cultural tool, providing much needed connections to what we call nature, and sometimes to cultures not our own. 
as Henri Lefebvre contended, a new space that confronts the abstract homogeneity of modernism and big capital, quote, cannot be born, produced, unless it accentuates differences, end quote. So maybe there's some possibility of a multi-centered, decentered regionalism that's simultaneously a product and a resistance to global hegemony. All places exist somewhere between the inside and outside views of them, the ways in which they compare to and contrast with other places. A big percentage of those living in New York, and maybe most of you in this room, are from away, yet your habits and expectations help form this ever-changing place. There's voluntary dislocation, as in my own. I now look at Manhattan, where I was born from the outside. I can barely jaywalk with confidence anymore. <laughs> There's voluntary dislocation, as in immigration, and involuntary dislocation, as in refugees or deportees, and so forth. But ultimately, they're all a form of location. So Lower Manhattan and Galisteo, New Mexico, what could these two disparate places have in common? Dislocation by gentrification, for starters. We've heard a lot about urban gentrification. In 2007, Jerry Lewin Kingsley Hammett from Santa Fe edited a hard-hitting anthology called The Suburbanization of New York. When I wrote a geographical memoir for it called Seven Stops in Lower Manhattan, I revisited all the places I'd lived. Washington Place, Avenue A, 9th and 10th Street, Avenue D and 7th, Bowery and Delancey, Grand and Thompson, Prince and West Broadway. Gentrification has changed most of them in sometimes surprising ways. When I prowl the neighborhoods in both the tarted up Tompkins Square playground, where when I took my kid there, the sandbox was full of broken glass, and the great old community art garden on Avenue C, they were locked up at midday. It's easier to recognize, there's the community garden, maybe behind here. It's easier to recognize a place than to try to remake it. Place making can be a rather arrogant presumption on the part of designers and planners, as we've heard quite a bit about recently. Sometimes idealistic and well-intended, sometimes predatory. It's too easy to simply deliver made places over to capitalism. Though infrastructure, transportation, commercial access, and lack thereof all alter places, there's a difference between external imposition and internal desire. One of my favorite slogans is, Nothing about us, without us, is for us. In 1960, Kevin Lynch proposed the radical notion of interview techniques to help planners understand people's mental pictures of cities and landscapes, which paved the way for artists to tap urban energies in formal or improvisational street works. Cities are sites of constant negotiation. Urban neighborhoods can be, but often are not, microcosmic communities, the counterparts of rural villages. No community is monolithic, but residents are more likely to want to work at placemaking if they share some kind of transcommunal identity politics. The real task in a real city is to make places, plural, rather than a place. And as one active New York public artist puts it, to use art to decode and reimagine the city. Gentrification in Galisteo too, is a handy tool for making, remaking, and destroying places. And it's not just about income inequity. The desirable mixed income identity often can't survive the onslaught of ambitious development. Artists have been what I used to call a flying wedge of gentrification in the ongoing march of both urban and rural gentrification. It's a process that created the current Soho and the current Galisteo village. And it reemerged in spades when Alphabet City or Loisaida bit the dust in the 1980s. Now, of course, there's Williamsburg, Long Island City, Gowanus, I don't know what the hot place is now. Can Staten Island be far behind? When a longtime vibrant, if struggling, neighborhood or village is in the process of becoming a temporary vibrant art neighborhood, there's an exciting window before it's co-opted by commerce and wealth, a vital point when the best of both places coexist, before resentment and violence come with the realization that eviction looms. For instance, back in the late 70s, artists found Loisaida, Lower East Side, <laughs> attractive again, <laughs> precisely because of its predominantly Latino populations, which made it so alive and so foreign. And it goes both ways. Newcomers were sometimes welcome for similar reasons. 
New neighborhood alliances were formed, think group material. Reactionary pop culture brought a second-rate actor to the White House. And progressive pop culture tried to provide an antidote with punk, imported from British working class and Americanized into middle class rebellion. And the people evicted from their places by artists, they moved further out, further away from schools, jobs, groceries, and amenities. Sometimes artists follow them, and sometimes locals become artists. Think fashion moda in the South Bronx in the 80s. As working people are deracinated, the marginal art world, which is where I like to hang out, is decentralized and diversified. The political zeitgeist is often a catalyst. Increasing opposition to the Vietnam War in the 1960s coincided with the demise of light manufacturing in what came to be Soho, with subsequent colonization by artists and the struggle for new loft laws. Indirectly, capital profited from progress. In the 80s, grassroots left cultural movements were revitalized by an influx of disillusioned and or idealistic young artists, well-trained and ambitious, but dissatisfied with the narrowness and elitism of the art world in which they were supposed to make it. Collaboration, the social extension of the collage aesthetic, has long been an antidote to the powerful sense of alienation that characterizes late capitalism, which divides and separates through specialization at the same time that it homogenizes. Geographical collaboration can produce a complex merger of high and low culture, with young artists teaming up in temporary and diverse coalitions with community artists and the ever restless left. Putting things together without divesting them of their own identities is a metaphor for cultural democracy. So this new milieu in the early 80s emerged across conventional borders in scruffy, open, place-oriented theme shows and storefronts and derelict spaces such as the notorious Times Square show and the more socially targeted real estate show. Murals and public projects, the squatters movement became vehicles not only for social change but for cutting edge art. And publications were also recognized as public spaces. Whoops, where that's thing. Anyway, uh, for it, and there was a rash of raw, grainy newsprint zines, comics like the Enduring World War III and artist books, pioneering a chaotic aesthetic of display and independent distribution. Rural gentrification looks different and spawns a different kind of energy, more scattered, more ecologically and traditionally focused, but it's no less pervasive. The American West is both the most urban and the most rural part of the country. Five-acre ranchettes stand out like sore thumbs in the wide open landscape of northern New Mexico. Ridgetop McMansions loom over Santa Fe, a once compact ancient city. There's gentrification and there's la gente, the people. Some linguistic root, same linguistic root, but very different meanings and goals. My historically Hispano farming village began to change in the 1950s when a couple of Anglo art types fixed up an old adobe. In the 1970s, just as in Soho, an influx of hippies and artists shifted Galisteo's identity. By then, the little old working farms and ranches were lost to lawyers and ricos, then swallowed up by larger Anglo-owned tax spreads and subdivisions. The Hispano elders whose ancestors settled the area 200 years ago are almost all gone. A few of their adult children have stayed in the village, but there's no work, and large families have outgrown small inherited properties. They come back Sundays for church. Then there's designer Tom Ford, who owns a 25,000-acre ranch across the road from me, and a mansion in Santa Fe, and homes in LA, New York, Milan, London, something like that, who gives multi-centeredness a whole new meaning. Sprawl is creeping inexorably toward our little village as Texas developers trump residents' concerns and mediocre local politicians don't resist. The subdivision adjacent to the village developed in the late 1970s is appropriately called Ranchitos de Galisteo, or Little Ranches, which now means ranchettes, and is bigger than Galisteo itself. As it grew, it drastically shifted the village's demographics. Everywhere in the Southwest, these complex intersections and collisions of culture and politics are taking place. Native Americans are trying to protect sacred secret spaces hidden imperceptibly in the landscape. Hispanos are fighting for recognition of historic Spanish and Mexican land grants. 
and dominant Anglo newcomers, Anglo means outsider, uh, African Americans, Asian Americans are all Anglo too, are often unaware of these histories. The endless battles determine the fate of people, wildlife, and open spaces, making the possibility of bioregional political organization all the more desirable and all the more elusive. Water is running out. Climate change related fires and flooding of parched lands are more frequent and more extreme. Natural resources are being ripped from the earth like there's no tomorrow. It drives me nuts when my neighbors shrug and say, eh, you can't fight progress. All change is not progress. My mantra is long-term thinking is in short supply. In contrast to Kenneth Frampton's notion of critical regionalism, which is more critical than regional, my own interests lie in the ways in which independence and sometimes power is generated even by temporary and or serial senses of racination. I aspire to what he calls a critical arriere guard that, quote, distances itself equally from the Enlightenment myth of progress and from a reactionary, unrealistic impulse to return to the architectonic forms of the pre-industrial past, avoiding nostalgic historicism or the glibly decorative, as well as conservative populism and sentimental regionalism, end quote. My own project, and I'm hardly alone, has been to untie the regional from such dated associations, to set it free from the notion that the local is by definition sentimental, reactionary, and nostalgic, and even fascist, and to describe its covert potential for resistance, for the most, un most part unconscious and unrecognized. For years, I've been preoccupied with the idea of social energies not yet recognized as art. I've been involved in community planning, county open spaces and trails, watershed preservation, a community newsletter, creation of a park from an urban rail yard, brownfield, all issues that proceed under the radar, or the under the art radar, but that are also considered by the left or were once considered by the left as soft politics. Except for the park, I haven't run into artists in these milieu or much art emerging from these social processes. Such social energies ring the mainstream or commercial art world, gaining a grudging entrance now and then. Thank God for creative time. You can name some well-known artists, most of them women, who've worked for decades on environmental actions that break down some of these barriers between art and everything else. Ed Reinhardt once said, art is art and everything else is everything else. In the last four decades, the art-identified ripples have gradually widened from graffiti to sign projects to community gardens and food pieces and all the stuff we saw this morning and farms to landfill, sewer plants reimagined to mine reclamation and land restoration. This expansion can be traced back to Duchamp, whose ready-mades not yet recognized as art, invaded the sacred spaces of high culture, to pop art with its embrace of commercial culture, to minimalism and its fabrication process, playing down the artist's touch, to conceptualism when ideas and dematerialized forms facilitated new methods of distribution. And I'd include in this trajectory much ephemeral public art and of course guerrilla performances and political actions. Before I lived in the West, I saw the huge Western earthworks as an exciting new public art outlet, escapes from the art world's institutionalized trajectory that offered an antidote to an urban landscape often crammed with visual competition. Whoops, I'm not going to make it. <laughs> Since then, I talk about land art in the rearview mirror because it's been replaced in my windshield by stuff closer to the ground, like land use. For all their allure, the earthworks are a pseudo-rural art made by a metropolitan headquarters, borrowing the emotional power of extraordinary Western landscapes and feeding on distance from people, from issues, and even from places. How much time do I have? Anyway, up. When I started to think about what kind of land art would make sense in my own rural environment, I realized none. Land art is for city people. Uh, <laughs> And I'm, I'm just going to skip something here. Artists are complicitous in the way the world is seen. <laughs> I can't. I can't do anything. 
it says 1951, you're, you're, you're taking time. <laughs> in, uh, so little, little. In, in both cities and countryside, there's a constant dynamic play of destruction and construction, location, and dislocation. When sites or even towns are destroyed or dislocated from their original identities, there's a moment of possibility, a crack in the system's barricades into which artists can creep. As Eduardo Gallano has said, let's save pessimism for better times. But we do need to discuss our failures. We need radical optimism, too, and maybe we need to analyze our successes. We need new strategies for subversion, new image wars, new occupations that ignore the false dichotomy between urban and rural spaces. And who better to invent them than you all, the participants in the Creative Time Summit. Happy creeping. <laughs>